You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Can we just talk? Talk about where we're going before we get lost. Bum, bum. Let me your thoughts. Can get what we want without knowing something, something. Uh, uh. That's it. Boom. That's as far Dun. as we're going. <laughs> Can't we just talk, Josh? Can't we just talk? Or discuss? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It's not a deck tech. It's a deck talk. Ooh. Two deck talks. Two deck talks. <laughs> What's up, everyone? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. So we're going to be talking about uh, the decks that Jimmy and I played on the most recent episode of Game Nights. We're not going to do full-on deck techs like we used to do. We figured this way we can talk about both decks. Yeah, and especially because there's a couple of interesting considerations about your deck that we could dive a little deeper into without sort of having to cover the whole, like, what's the removal, what's the card draw, yada, yada. Yeah, we're going to have the full lists for each deck linked in the show notes. So if you want to go line by line of every single card in the deck, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But we're just going to kind of go through the highlights and then mostly kind of what our thinking was when designing the deck, what we were worried about, what kind of strategies we put in there in a broad sense. So um, a little bit different than our normal deck decks. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Before we get into it, though, well, if you want to get your hands on a Kirli, a Kirli, a Kirli, Fearless Voyager, <laughs> or Phylath, what's Phylath? World Sculptor. If you want either of these or any of the new legendary creatures from Zendikar Rising, or maybe you want to get your hands on those fancy expeditions mm-hmm. or anything at all from the set, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate link. If you use it when you are making your magic card purchases, whether you're getting a booster box, a set booster, or you're ordering singles, you really, if you use that affiliate link, are supporting our show. You're getting the magic cards you want, and you're just making our content continue to happen. And on this episode of Game Nights was the first time we were able to showcase the brand new Ultra Pro sleeves, the Eclipse Gloss. Uh, These are sleeves that I've been waiting for for a very long time. We already love Ultra Pro sleeves because they're super easy to shuffle. But before in the past, the Eclipse sleeves had more of a matte finish, which I also like. But as a foil enthusiast myself and with brand new cards, these new gloss sleeves look amazing. And as always, we've been trusting Ultra Pro since day one to protect our cards on the show, as well as, you know, in our binders and wherever else we store them. So if if you want to keep your cards in tip-top condition, especially when you buy them from Card Kingdom, support Ultra Pro. You're also supporting this show. I didn't think I cared about that matte finish, but then I saw the the eclipse or the, the, the gloss. gloss eclipses, and I'm like, wow, the cards just do look so much more vibrant. <laughs> I do want to put all my decks in those eventually. Yeah, I mean, it's up to because I still like the matte finish on certain decks, but if I have a ton of foils, I think I'm going to switch the gloss for those ones. It also takes a while to switch an entire deck out in the sleeve, so yes. I'm probably just going to do like five or so and then be like... Because the, the old Good Eclipses enough. protect the cards perfectly and the shuffle's still great, so there's yeah. no reason to just waste all those. But, all right, sorry. Um, put a, it, put move, another deck into them. Try there you the go. Draft sleeves. Just build new decks. Why yeah, not? Why not? All right. Uh, and the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You can contribute at various tier levels, and there are lots of different rewards. Uh, one of the rewards is you can chit chat with jimmy and i on our discord server each and every day in fact there's a ton of people on there there's like often more than a thousand people on our discord yes so if you need deck deck help or um have any questions or you know anything at all about commander yeah yeah, there's all kinds of stuff there's tons of veteran uh, edh players to talk Mm -hmm. to also um patrons that qualify they just qualified to get the epic play play mat for free through the Patreon. Um, and that's something, unfortunately, you can't get anymore because the Kickstarter's over. Sorry about <laughs> that. Uh, also, patrons are eligible to audition to be on game nights. Yes, this is huge. Uh, we've been waiting to hold these for a while now, but we think it's the right time. All you have to do to audition for game nights and to be eligible is just to be a patron of our show. It is okay to join the patron literally just to send in an audition. That is totally fine by us. But this way, we at the very least are not opening the gates to everyone on the internet. We have to, crazy. we got to limit it somehow because if we got 100,000 submissions uh, to audition for the show, there's no way to go through that many. Um, but patrons, even if you just contribute one dollar per month, you can audition for the show. Uh, we should we should mention that you must be eighteen years or older to audition. A couple other questions we're getting a lot. Yes, if you're not from the United States, you can audition. There's some rules and restrictions. There'll be a link in the show notes. Make sure that you follow all of those instructions and read all those details. Uh, also. Obviously, there's a pandemic going on. We're just doing the auditions right now. We're not going to set a date yet for when 
we're going to record that episode with mm-hmm. the chosen guest. We're going to wait, obviously, until the world is safe and it's okay to do that. So a lot of people are going, well, I can't travel right now because of the pandemic. And so I don't <laughs> want to audition. We don't want you to travel either. Yeah, exactly. We're Once we pick the people who are going to be on Game Nights, once we pick the, the guest, then we're going to work with that person once the world, again, is safe to figure out a date that everybody is comfortable with and it works for everybody. Yep. Okay. Oh, and finally, we shout out one lucky patron oh, yeah. every single episode. Jeez, so I almost forgot. This episode is dedicated, dedicated to, to Nicholas Laranaga. Laranaga. Creature type Naga. Yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> you have a creature type Naga. You got to build a Naga tribal deck. Yeah, Nicholas. you definitely do. Probably already has one. All right, let's go to the main topic, <laughs> which uh, we're calling Game Nights Deck Talk. Talk about decks. <laughs> um, all right so i've been playing around with boros lately we've talked about it a few times on the show so this akiri fearless voyager deck that i played on game nights was a chance to kind of showcase some of the stuff i've been messing around with on game nights and i think it had a pretty good showing i mean obviously mm-hmm. i got knocked out first but my deck yeah, showed, you showed a little too hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> but the deck definitely showed what it could do and 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 it's super fun to play i played it a few times since i think you've actually played boros more than anyone else on the show have i i've yeah. only done it twice yeah i mean yeah. nobody's played that much sun speaker this yeah. yeah uh so well let's read akiri fearless voyager just uh, to get that out of the way it's one red white so three mana total for a three three core warrior whenever you attack a player with one or more equipped creatures draw a card mm. and then you can pay a white and unattach an equipment from a creature you control if you do tap that creature and it gains indestructible until end of turn um this is almost, somebody pointed this out to me, this is almost like pay a white, unattach an equipment, target creature gains regenerate. Oh, right, it taps, it taps them it. Yeah, and yeah, makes yeah. them indestructible. Uh, there's a little confusion with the first line. Whenever you attack a player with one or more equipped creatures, draw a card. This means that if you have multiple creatures that have equipment on them, if they all attack the same player, you'll only draw one card. But if they attack different players, you can draw up to one extra card per player. Yep. So if I have three equipped creatures and I attack Jimmy with one, Mel with one, Megan with one, I'll draw three cards. Yeah, that's actually pretty good for Boros. It, it gives you the ability to do so. Of course, the hoop you have to jump through is a very Boros thing, which is equipping your creatures. But Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a tough thing. And I, I mentioned this before. I'm not in love with the fact that they made an already sort of underpowered strategy, which is aggro, right? Voltron aggro. Yeah. Is there a, is there a weaker strategy in Commander? Then they said, on top of that, we can't even have you play that in the way that would be advantageous to you, at least give you the best chance of winning, which is generally focus on one player, knock them out, move down the line. These type of decks don't usually have a good uh, time of it when they split their damage up among all the players. But and you make a lot more people angry as a result. Yeah, exactly. But Akiri, she incentivizes that because you'll draw more cards. So it's it's still, fi- it's still fine. I think you know this is still a powerful deck, but it... You can't build, I don't think, in a Kiri Fearless Voyager deck that's at like an CEDH level. No, definitely not. And one of the biggest things about equipment is that the equip cost is a huge part and a huge mana sink, especially in colors that do not have access to the same kind of ramp that other colors do. So you actually made the note that there is another kind of build of this deck based on that second ability. Yeah, so I chose not to build the deck in this way, obviously, but I think there is maybe a, a Kiri plus like mass board wipe deck because you can give your creatures indestructible for pretty cheap if you build it right Mm -hmm. so there's probably like an akiri deck that kind of plays similar to like a um tajik deck or uh even avison where it says okay i'm gonna board wipe a lot and i'm gonna give my creatures indestructible um maybe even ones that do that with like mass land destruction simultaneously like those cards that say destroy artifacts enchantments lands and creatures and i'm just gonna have like three creatures left at the end of this because I gave them indestructible. There's probably that build. Obviously, I, I think for obvious reasons, I didn't want to make that one for game nights. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of tapping too. Like it's one man, white man each time to unequip yeah. creatures, and you're saving like what three creatures at most from a board wipe. So and then you have like to have how much mana? Because board wipe seven cheap. mana yeah. total. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay, so let's talk about. I obviously went leaned into the card draw aspect. Big surprise. Uh, <laughs> and you kind of need to. Yeah. So let's talk about the challenges of building this deck. Um, There were sort of three main challenges that I ran into. One was balancing creatures and equipment. And another thing we've talked about, I think, Jimmy, on the last few episodes when we've talked about carrying stuff is equipment decks naturally have this tug and pull of like, well, you need equipment because otherwise your commander doesn't do much because it literally says equipment in both of its abilities. Yep. But then equipment do nothing. If you just play a sword of Feast and Famine out on the board and you don't have anything else, it doesn't do anything. 
Yep. So you need to balance up creatures and equipment. You can't do too many of either because there will be games where you draw more of one type than the other and you're not going to be happy about it. So that was a big challenge of building the deck was figuring out like, how do I have make sure that I have creatures to put this equipment on, but mm. also make sure that I have equipment, but never have a lot of equipment and no creatures. And that's just a, a tug and pull. We'll talk about a little further. The second challenge was figuring out how to not just fold to like <laughs> key removal or board wipes. And that's a problem that I think Boros and generally like creature based attack strategies have, which is you often get out to these good starts and then you can't hold on to them because somebody just cyclonic rifts and the game's basically over for you. Or they say, okay, remove that creature and that creature and the game's basically over for or you. Or in response to you paying five to equip it, sorry, it's going to get pathed. Oof. Yep. And now it's like, oh, they removed my two key creatures and that's it. Now I got to play a creature, equip it, wait to get around rotation of the table. And I can just never sort of get my footing again in that game. Not to mention that Kiri is like your only really reliable card draw card in the entire deck. She gets removed once and costs five mana the second time around. It is, you are in an awfully disadvantaged position at that point. Yeah, so you want to sort of, fi again, figure out a way to not fold to key removal and board wipes. And then this is related, but the third challenge of the deck was remaining relevant in the late game. These decks often are scary early. And then mm -hmm. by the time you get to nine, 10, 11 turns, the stuff that other people are doing just outclasses the stuff that you're doing because all of your stuff is sort of meant to get out and attack people early. Early, yeah. Yeah. So number two and number three are sort of both partially about ramp and cards, right? Or amount of mana. And this is obviously a problem that Boros has. Like one of the reasons Boros is weak is because around 9, 10, 11, those turns... Other players have 15, 16 mana available to them, and you have seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And so they're just basically taking two turns when you're taking one. And that just means if the game goes that long, and most games do, we found, um, you're just falling behind every turn that happens. So how do uh, you keep up in those realms was a big question I'm always asking when building any deck, but especially Boros. Yeah, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but you definitely found an interesting, albeit a uh, slightly prohibitive way to do that. And that's something that I think is an interesting thing to take note of, especially if you're someone at Wizards, because if this is one of your only options to do so... Yeah, eh, maybe Boros needs some help, like we've been saying, A little right? bit of help, yeah. Uh, the next area of, of that we just sort of talked about is tempering your equipment expectations. Um, this deck has 13 total equipment in it. That was the most I could felt like I could fit. Before you start overwhelming, you know, you don't want to again draw a hand and have five equipment, no creatures. Yeah, so. that started to happen when I would goldfish it when I had like 15 or so equipment. And that mm. feels weird because usually we say if a deck has a theme, it wants 25 or so of that thing, but this is not the case here. Yeah, and equipment, again, unlike a creature in another deck that might fit a theme, just doesn't do anything by itself. It, it requires another piece of person or human or creature or whatever to make sure it works. And the thing that felt kind of bad about building this deck and trying to build it well was also that I kind of didn't get to fit in a lot of the really exciting, exotic equipment that you think of when you're like, equipment deck, this is the place I'm finally going to play those oh, yeah. big, crazy Scary equipment. Things, yeah. yeah. And I really only got to play what I would consider to be two, uh, quote unquote, exotic equipment. Yeah, and those two are Argentum Armor, which is a uh, pretty expensive six mana, six equip cost. But when a creature that's equipped with an attack to destroy a permanent, which is pretty nuts. It was plus six, plus six, so it yeah. makes them big. But it's six to play and six to equip. That was my one nod towards like, listen, I can't build this equipment deck and not have one really huge equipment. Splashy thing, yeah. Yeah, and Helm of the Host is the other one. It's four mana for an equipment five to equip at the beginning of combat on your turn create a token that's a copy of equipped creature except the token isn't legendary if equipped creature is legendary and that token gains haste mm, more carries more card draw yep also pretty good with goto we talked about yes. um earlier that's it those are the big equipment i have some sort ofs and some other stuff but as far as like big splashy things that's all i felt i could have because if you draw argentum armor in your opening hand it is bad because it's not doing anything for Yeah, it's basically not a card in your hand, right? It's as though you immediately mold six with a six drop in your hand. So imagine you ever have two of those. You're just hating life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this deck runs Bonesaw, which is zero cost equipment, just so you understand how important it is more to get equipment out early and equip it as opposed to playing the big whopper. Yeah, and that's a really good point. You want your equipment to be cheap to play and to equip. In fact, one of the best equipments in the deck is Shuko, which is one mana for an equipment. Equip creature gets plus one, plus oh, but it has an equip cost 
of zero. Oh. This is really good in the deck because the ability to slide your equipment around to your different creatures is so important, right? Because you don't want one creature with 15 equipment on it. You want three creatures, right. each with one equipment on it. So when you play, it can get super expensive, right? If they're all sort of feasts and famines, that's six <laughs> mana to move stuff around or yeah. whatever. And so Shuko just gives you the ability to be like, okay, slide this over. And then you want sometimes multiple equipment on creatures too because of that second ability, to the ability to give it indestructible. So you swing in. You don't want to be unequipping something Argentum armor, right? right? Because it's six mana to put it back on. So Shuko gives you the ability to give it its indestructible, but it's zero to put back on. Yeah, really cheap to re-equip and stuff, so that makes a lot of sense there. And also you play it turn one, play a, a, a you know, two drop, play a Kira on three, equip the Shugo to your two drop swing, and you're already drawing cards. Yeah, zero equip cost, very, very good here, just because, again, it's more about the Kira's ability to draw you cards than it is about, you know, paying six for an Argentum armor in the Boros deck. Also want to note that there were, there are a number of sort of tutors for equipment in the deck. There's Stoneforge Mystic, Relic Seeker, Steel Shaper's Gift, and Enlightened Tutor. So that's virtually four more equipment. Mm -hmm. You can sort of count them. So there's really 17 equipment in the deck, which gives you a higher rate at hitting equipment, but you don't have to sacri sacrifice. sacrifice. You don't have to make the sacrifices in the deck as far as like not having as many creatures to fit those extra equipment in. Yeah, I love Steel Shaper's Gift. It's one of those like, hey, white can actually have a really efficient tutor for this specific thing. Yep. So very nice. All right, let's talk about the big part of the deck the thing you referred to jimmy which i'm calling the boros land ramp hacks oh nice hacks hacks means you're like beating the system you're you're getting in there you're doing something to disrupt it you're doing something out of the norm right yeah we've alluded to this before and i, I just want to make a um disclaimer here what we're about to talk about it's not cheap oh. all the pieces are expensive there's no budget way to do this i wish there was that's not our fault right this is a thing that wizards has there's these pieces these cards and i think that in boros you really helps you a lot to do this type of strategy but unfortunately like not everybody has those cards and can do it so i, I apologize it's, we don't we're not in charge of reprints so i can't do anything about that part of it yeah and of course the cards that you do need 12 of them that you have in the deck not all of them are the expensive ones but every fetch land you can stick in here you're going to need for this strategy yeah you want as many fetch lands as you can so all the all the zendikar and onslaught fetches the ones where you pay one life and they come into play untapped as long as it's matching one of the two colors in deck which is white or red so like bloodstained mire has black and red in it but you're only caring about the red marsh flats is a white and black fe fetch but only has white in it that you care about but these are legal to play in your commander deck yep so you play as many of those as you can then like evolving wilds terramorphic expanse fable passage prismatic vista not a cheap one again yep. myriad landscape uh you're playing as many of these as possible because you're going to put Crucible of Worlds in the deck, first of all, another not cheap card, mm -hmm. especially with Zendikar <laughs> Rising just coming out and every card being good with that. Well, that's a card that lets you play lands from your graveyard. So this is virtual card draw every time you play a land from your graveyard because that's a land you didn't have to draw for your deck or play from your hand, right? Yep. So there's some card advantage right there. And then you're also going to play, there's these white cards and they, they've printed a few of them recently that bring back permanence from your graveyard to the battlefield if the permanent went to the graveyard that same turn. Yep, so brought back is the one from M20. Savin's Reclamation came in the commander set recently in Second Sunrise. Um, now, Second Sunrise is a bit more uh, risky because each player returns to play yep. all artifact, creature, enchantment, and land cards that are put into their graveyard this, play in, uh, this turn. But brought back and Savin's Reclamation are about returning permanents, uh, sometimes with a CMC cost or ones that were put there in um, to the graveyard this turn and to get back to the battlefield. So it's almost like rebuying, again, a fetch land. Brought back is very powerful if you have it in your opening hand with two fetch lands because it's white, white for an instant. Choose up to two target permanent cards from your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Return them to the battlefield tapped. So here's what you do. Fetch land, turn one, don't crack it. Mm -hmm. Turn two, fetch land, crack them both. Go find two planes or two whatever plateau Rapport, shock land. Land. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah now you have two white tap the two white cast brought back it brings the two fetch lands back into play tapped you just ramping or sorry you just explosive vegetation for two mana yeah so you've got four mana in play at the end of your turn two if and you can do that sometimes right brought back with 12 fetch lands in the deck is a decent chance to do that and even if you just get one fetch land back it's rampant growth which white doesn't have. Yeah. So brought back with enough fetch lands is just an extremely good card in the deck. Second Sunrise can do the same thing, but on turn three, a little harder to do it. Um, I've found myself more likely to do Second Sunrise like turn six or seven where I get like a mirrored landscape, maybe crack a 
um, another fetch line, maybe a Wayfarer's Bobble. Do, try and do three things all at once. Yeah. Second Sunrise, boom, get three things back. It's also very good at, you know, board wipe protection if someone, a lot of artifacts in this deck, so if someone Vandal blasts you, then the Second Sunrise is going to save you quite a bit there. Yeah, and a lot of times holding open Second Sunrise feels bad because if they don't board wipe you, you feel like you wasted it. But if you were simultaneously like, oh, I'm holding open all these things. Yeah. And they, if they don't board wipe me, I'm going to crack my mirrored landscape, crack my Wayfarer's Bobble, crack this fetch land, get all three back onto the battlefield. And if they do board wipe me, then I'm going to get all my creatures back on the battlefield with it and protect myself that way. Yeah, pretty sweet. And yeah. then Savin's Reclamation is a three mana, but this one's a sorcery. It's returning a target permanent with CMC three or less. And then you can actually flash it back for four and a white. And if you do that, you actually get to cast it twice and choose a new target. So this is also good for if someone gets rid of your sword of Feast and Fame, which yep. is a three drop thing as well as the fetch lands or crucible of worlds whatever key pieces you need to keep that train going uh and face reward is another one i didn't put it in the deck i thought three of these was enough but you could use that as mm -hmm. one of the cards in this sort of suite and that's only like five to six cards that's i, I call it a package right that package of like boros land ramp is not huge and doesn't affect your deck a lot. It's just not cheap because of Crucible of Worlds and all the fetch lands. But fetch lands are replacing lands in your deck, so it doesn't change your deck building much. And so you're just saying, can I make room for Crucible of Worlds, brought back Second Sunrise, Savine's Reclamation? And all of a sudden, that actually does a pretty good job of helping you ramp quite a bit because Enlightened Tutor can go find Crucible of Worlds. Right. And then you've got other synergies with cards you're already going to play. You know, um, Wayfarer's Bobble, I already talked about. Burnished Heart, yeah. another one that sacrifices, and it died that turn, so maybe you bring it back. It puts lands into play. Sort of Feast and Famine, um, you mentioned, Jimmy. Also, like, Sunforger can go get the instant versions, can get brought back, and oh, second right. Sunrise. Oh, you passed it off of that. Yeah, 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 so you can you can set this up knowing that, oh, Sunforger's going to get me the second Sunrise. I'm going to set up my fetch land thing, you know, crack a couple of them, get some extra lands in play. And I found myself with this deck fairly often you know, in the middle turns, five, six, seven, doing the brought back second sunrise thing and getting an additional three lands into play through some, you know, careful planning. And that actually catapults you into a position where like often I'll be even or ahead of even green decks with the amount of lands I've got in play. Yeah, I mean, turn two, Explosive Vegetation with that brought back play is pretty strong. And five to six cards may seem like a lot, but Crucible of Worlds plus a fetch land is guaranteed card draw. And that's just like something that white would die to have. Unfortunately, it comes with two very expensive cards, but them's the breaks. Yeah, I mean, like we said, we wish they were cheap, they're not. Um, and then you get other synergies in the deck because you're going to be doing the fetch land thing. You got 12 fetch lands, you're going to Crucible of Worlds, brought back all the stuff, going to bring lands into play. So you get to play like Felidar Retreat, which we've talked about a few so times. Good. Every time I get that card onto the battlefield, it just feels so good. And this is in a Boros deck. Yeah, Felidar Retreat, just so you know, it's a new card from Zenicar Rising, three in the white for an enchantment, landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under control, you can choose one. You can create a 2-2 white cat beast creature token or put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control, and those creatures gain vigilance until end of turn. So again, when you have fetch lands, that's two landfall triggers right there. When you have the brought back second sunrise type stuff, you're getting tons of landfall triggers. You make your creatures huge, give them vigilance, do whatever you want. Make more cats. Yeah, I had a game the other night where I hit four landfall triggers the turn I played uh, Felidar Retreat <laughs> because of brought back. And then I hit two more on my turn to give everything plus one, plus one, because what I brought back was two fetch lands. Mm -hmm. And then I ran out of basic lands in the deck <laughs> uh, just because of how much I was doing this. I think there, there, there's an improvement I can make. I think I could put three or four more basics in the deck. But that's how much lands this deck is getting onto the battlefield. Um, Amiria Shepherd is another yeah. card that takes advantage of landfall. It's... It's a 4-4 angel for 7 mana, but it says when a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may return target non-land permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. But if the land is a plains, you may return the non-land permanent card to the battlefield instead. And so with all this shenanigans with Crucible brought back, all that stuff, you're often able to rebuild board states that have been lost with the Myriad Shepherd. So it's a card you hold in your hand and wait until like you've been set back. Don't just float it out there when you're ahead. Yeah. And then go boom, crack, 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 brought back bring back like five, six things that died. And that just goes nuts at that point too, which is pretty insane. Um, not to mention, because you have Crucible of Worlds, the modal double face cards that come in mm. Zendikar Rising are also affected by this because if you're playing a card, let's say like Valakut Awakening, which is two in red for an instant to put any number of cards from your hands on the bottom of your library, then draw that many cards plus one. It's a land on the back. So in the graveyard, you're able to play this as the land side of it because that's what Crucible of Worlds says. So you're actually getting double value off it. You can play it as the spell 
hotel side and crucible gives you access to it on the permanent side yep exactly there's a one three creature skyclave cleric that i put in the deck because it's a modal double face card and that means i can put equipment on it swing around with it if it ever dies it goes in my graveyard and crucible could possibly get it back or even you know yeah savine's reclamation or something if i needed to yeah because skyclave cleric is a permanent you can get it back with brought back in second sunrise and then play it as a land uh valka awakening and sajiri shelter which are the other two in this deck are not permanent so those only function with crucible of worlds but still very powerful uh and then of course like strip mine very good with crucible oh gosh a, a card you want to play in most decks scavenger grounds you can just silver bullet a lot of graveyard decks by just having crucible and scavenger grounds and just being like well you're never gonna have a graveyard for this whole game yep obviously it hurts you a little bit because you want to do the crucible thing but and strip mining someone every single turn is brutal yeah even if they have a actually lines. That won't work with Scavenger Grounds. It'll exile itself, won't it? Yeah. Sacrifice a desert, exile all cards from all graveyards. It's in there. So never mind the Scavenger Grounds thing. But no, it will work with itself, right? You tap it, sacrifice it, and then... It exiles itself from the graveyard. Oh, when it gets to the graveyard? Yeah, because that trigger is on the stack, right? Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Strip Mine, though. Still good with Crucible of Worlds. Strip Mine is... Yeah, that's dirty. If you want to lose some friends, Strip Mine Crucible of Worlds hey, is listen, a great you're way. playing Boros Equipment. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, do, do whatever you want. <laughs> Have fun. All right, and finally, um, don't call it a comeback is the last <laughs> uh, the last section that I wanted to talk about. So, so what are we calling it then? Uh, winning when you're ahead is fairly straightforward, right? Just keep doing what you've been doing. So you don't really have to think about that too much in the mm -hmm. deck. But it's important, I think, when deck building to consider, well, how does my deck come from behind in games and end up winning? Like, when you're building your deck, you need to think of this scenario because you're going to be in that situation quite often in games of Commander. So I always want to have some options that give my deck a chance to come from behind and win. And the first step of that is having enough mana, mm -hmm. which we've covered, right? So that you can do a lot, even if you've been set back and you're behind. If you're just at five mana, your ability to recover and come back from behind is almost nil. Whereas if you have 12, 14 mana on the battlefield, even if you untap and that's all you've got, you have a chance, right? Because you can yes. do on a large amount of stuff. So uh, be explosive was one thing I wanted the deck to do. So um, hand weird battlements is a good card. That's just a land that can give haste to a creature. Yep. Uh, the next one is goblin assault. Oh, this is down my alley. Yeah. yeah it's just, you're creating a one, one red goblin creature token with haste at each at the beginning of your upkeeps. And you're just basically making a bigger, bigger army. And like with a carry needs creatures to equip stuff too. So even if those creatures die in combat, you're still able to draw cards with a carry. And I like that it gives it haste, right? So that if I've got a, that Goblin Assault out and they board wipe, on my turn, it makes a Goblin that I can slide some equipment onto and be attacking again right away. Yeah. Because I don't want to play a creature and then just be like, equip, Pass equip, turn. go. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be swinging. Um, and The then, less chance someone has to remove one of your creatures with a removal spell, sorcery, or instant, the better it is for this deck. Lightning Greaves, again, might seem a little weird. It, it can get awkward because you give Shroud. And so you sometimes are like, uh, Lightning Greaves onto it. Got to move it over to another creature to equip it with something else. Yeah. Then move the Lightning Greaves back. But it does give haste and it's zero to equip. So Notably, it, Akiri can also unequip it because she does not target with her second ability. It's just you may unattach an equipment from a creature you control. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, and then Felidar Retreat is another like explosive like i said i've gotten four five six landfall triggers between the course of somebody's end step and my turn with felidar retreat before and that's a way to be like make four cats make them all four fours swing at you for six you know equip equip swing at you for 20 yeah. after you just board wiped and so that's a way to sort of come from behind and get victory yep uh i like blink moth nexus too just a way to kill someone out of nowhere because it's a land that turns into a uh flying land and then you can also give it you know you can tap it and give some more uh yeah it's not the infect one yeah i didn't make it the infect one because the infect one i think in this deck would often just hit you for five infect and wouldn't matter it I would never do it again yeah you want the damage but this is a way that like they board wiped uh I still have a creature that I can equip to, right? I pay one, make it into a 1-1 one, one flyer, slide my two or three equipment onto it, and now I'm hitting you. Yep. And, you know, I can get the ball rolling again, maybe draw some cards. Needle Spires is another one. It's a land that turns into a 2-1 with Double Strike. Yeah, Double Strike plus equipment mm -hmm. is very, very good. Sort of Feast and Famine with that is really good because you'd untap your lands twice, maybe be able to use them in between depending on what else you've got in your hand. And then <laughs> every red deck I have, I've started putting these two cards in because they will just win you games that no other cards could win you. The first one is Mana Geyser. It's three red red for a sorcery, add red to your mana pool for each tapped land your opponents control. <sighs> Jeez, this thing can add up to like 20 mana sometimes. Yeah, I got 24 mana off it just the other day. Wow. And the thing is, that's like, 
equip Helm of the Host, play Helm of the Host, equip it, equip Argentum Armor, equip Sword of Feast and Famine. That right there is like so much mana normally that you'd never be able to do it. And that can just win you the game right there, right? Because it's like right. destroy permanent, hit you for 10, untap all my lands, you discard a card, like that can win the game. Uh, and then Fury Storm is another card that can just win the game out of nowhere because they play the card that they think is going to win the game, and you fork it two or three times, uh, which is what for- Fury Storm does. It forks- for free. Yeah, so when you cast Not this... Not for free. Sorry. You, it's, you, you double it for each time that you've cast your commander this turn. Right. So often if you're behind in a game, you've cast a Kiri at least twice because now she's costing seven mana. Maybe you haven't cast her the third yeah. time, but you're not... Like, if you've cast a Kiri only once and she's lived, you're not behind in the game. You're probably winning. If she's died a couple times and you've recast her, well, Fury Storm gets better, and that's a come-from-behind victory because a lot of times somebody plays some big spell that's going to ice the wind, Torment of Hellfire, Exsanguinate, those type of things, and you go, okay, Fury Storm, make three copies of it. (laughs) My copies resolve first. You're dead. Get wrecked. Yeah. So those are cards that I like to sort of... Uh, hold in the hand as a way to come from behind and also can save you in situations where like they counter your big game winning play and you fork it and counter their counter or whatever yeah i mean again just mana geyser is just one of those cards that, again massive explosiveness this deck is very mana hungry especially wants to equip a lot of stuff together so both of those make a lot of sense all right so that was my thinking when building the akiri fearless voyager deck and next we're going to go into jimmy's deck which was phylath World Sculptor. World Sculptor. But before we get into that, we're going to take a quick break, hear a message from our sponsors. Hey, dudes and dudettes, it's Daxos here. You know, I've done just about everything. Been the champion of Theros, died, returned. I'm practically immortal. I mean, when I go into battle, I don't even wear a shirt. But the one thing I never leave home without is my comfy as heck me undies. Whether I'm going toe to toe with Erebus or just stepping out for a slice of pizza, the most important thing is being as comfortable as possible. And me undies is totally serious about softness. No, like so serious, they scoured the world for the softest fabric known to man. And their undies grow on trees. No, seriously, they're made from irresistibly soft, natural fibers sourced from beechwood trees. And you know what natural fibers mean? That their micromodal is not only super soft, but breathable, light, and impossibly cozy. That's some serious comfort. Everything MeUndies does is to help you feel truly comfortable from head to toe, from outside to in. And they have a great offer right now for Command Zone listeners. To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, just go to MeUndies.com slash command. That's MeUndies.com slash command. All right, welcome back to the Game Nights Deck Talk. Talk. Can we just talk about Phylath, World Sculptor? Uh, <laughs> this is the deck that I played on Game Nights. Uh, and, of course, this deck is a lot of fun. It's a Landfalls Matters deck as well. However, in this case, basic lands are a bit prioritized. So let's read Phylath, World Sculptor, before we get into it. Four, a red and a green for a 5-5 five, five legendary creature elemental. When Phylath enters the battlefield, create a 0-1 green plant creature token for each basic land you control. And it has a landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put four plus one plus one counters on target plant you control. So the zero one plants, a lot of you may be familiar with because Avenger of Zendikar puts those out as well. Um, and it's for each basic land you control, you get a plant. However, when you are landfalling and putting counters on plants, it doesn't need to be those plants you just created with Phylath. As long as it is a plant, you can put some counters on it. And also, it can be the plants that Phylath created, which yeah, is yeah, fine yeah, too. Which right? is fine too, yeah. yeah. You turn a zero one into a four five for the land fall trigger which is pretty crazy uh yeah four plus one plus encounters i think this is a really big game for power and toughness with a landfall trigger and in red and green which has access to a lot of ways to get landfall triggers means that you can make some massive creatures or you can spread it out amongst a big army one thing i didn't think about until i was playing against the deck was how tough it is to block it or attack into it because yeah. i didn't really think about the fact that there's a ton of ways to get lands into play at instant speed and so you're constantly you're like okay well if i swing over there then he can just choose to put all the counters on that one and block with that one and if he's swinging at me whichever one i block he can put all the counters onto that one and so yep. it's just like it's very hairy like it, it's t- like once the plants start going you're just like okay i can never block or be or attack that thing i have to either fly over it or just use like straight up destruction because otherwise 
you know, there's no way to sort of correctly block if they can just switch who gets. Yeah, the yeah. you don't know what's in their hands. So they play some sort of instant hero or something. And you're like, OK, crap. Now that thing's got 16 power and it just eats whatever I was blocking with it. So, yeah. And not to mention lands because they enter the battlefield and can tap and be used immediately. Those are all also instant speed uh, landfall things if you're using fetch lands and stuff. Yep. So the challenges of designing this deck for me was figuring out how exactly I wanted to try and get to the win condition. So it was either going to be, you know, am I just making huge creatures in combat and swinging out that way? Am I going to do what I actually built more towards, which is use these creatures with their big power and toughness and fling them straight to people's faces? Am I going to try and trample over with damage? What is the exact way that I want to sort of deal with this? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the one of the big challenges is balancing the synergies of the deck and the win conditions because... Getting plus one, plus one counters is an entire road you could go down when you're building a deck. Like, oh, let's just make this all about plus one, plus one counters in red and green. Um, and then it's like, wait a minute, how many cards do I need to provide trample with? How many ways do you want to fling cards at people's faces and making sure that you're not going too heavy on any of them because you can't necessarily rely on combat damage to win the game. Um, so well, I thought... if somebody plays, you know some sort of propaganda effect or something oh, like gosh. that or yeah you want or they you just know they have constant miss in their hand or something. <laughs> like you need you need to be able to still win right have cards that let you win in those situations yeah and i focus more on the fling effect because that is an ability that is very hard to interact with if someone flings a creature at you because you're sacrificing it as a cost it's right. hard to interact with that instant speed um, and then the final challenge was deciding how many of these put extra lands into play cards I wanted to use. So cards like Azusa, Mina, and Den. Um, and overall... Oh, you mean play extra lands per turn? Play extra lands per turn, yeah, because yeah. that means more Phyleth triggers. Um, and for me, I actually kind of went away from that because Craig kind of had a very similar deck on Game Nights before. Rada. Rada, yeah, and, and Azusa and all that. And I was like, you know what, I'm... As also, like, Azusa and those cards are slightly higher on the budget range, as are a lot of the... I could just play every fetch land in this deck, right? So I decided, you know what? do that? <laughs> I'm going to try and go more of the non-expensive route uh, to see if I can do this without, you know, just making it a super expensive deck at the end of the day. Well, I think, and also you came up with a bunch of ways to put lands into play at instant speed, which Azusa and Mina and Den don't do, right? Yeah, they just play them on your turn. Which sort of leads into that thing I was talking about, which is makes it harder, harder to block. Like, if they have Azusa out, it's at least you know what you're facing. They either had to play the land or yeah. they didn't, right? Whereas if they've got something that says tap, put a land into play from their hand, well, it's like, okay, crap. Now they can do that at instant speed. At instant speed, yeah. And so I can't block, yeah. Well, you can block. You're just going to not like it. It's true. It's like, <laughs> uh, maybe I need to because I also don't want to just take, you know, 12 damage to the face. Yeah, that's one of those things. Like, you're often willing to trade off a creature if you know you're going to take, like, 16 otherwise. Yeah. You're like, fine, I don't want to take almost half my life total. But it can also be hard because it's like, well, I'm going to swing at you with three plants. Okay, if I block that one, he'll just put the counters on the other one. So, yeah, it gives you all the uh, ag agency. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about some of the ways to get landfall triggers in this deck. One of them is a really exciting one from Zendikar Rising. It's called Nahiri's Lithoforming. X red red sorcery sacrifice X lands for each land sacrifice this way draw a card you may play X additional lands this turn lands you control enter the battlefield tapped this turn so this is one of those things where it's like if you have extra lands in your hand and you want to play them uh, or you want to just sort of like you know you're like okay I have tons of lands out I've been playing ramp spells all game I can sacrifice five of these and still be fine I'll still have seven lands out you know, for seven mana, you draw five cards, and if you already have lands in your hand, you put them on the battlefield. You can probably get, on average, I would say, like, two to four landfall triggers from this, as well as the fact that you just get to draw extra cards. And like you said, you're often going to have lands in hand, so you yeah. know you're going to hit two of them, maybe, and then you're just hoping to draw two more. That's four. You sacrifice five. That's totally fine. And you draw a bunch of extra cards, too. Um, not to mention, this is one of those decks where you actually sometimes just don't purposely play lands or mm -hmm. don't crack certain fetches and certain things. You wait till the right time. Yeah. Um, another big way of getting landfall triggers, I thought, was at instant speed. So, Harrow's like one of those examples, but Roiling Regrowth was one that I the liked. The new Harrow? Yeah, the new Harrow. It's three mana for an instant. You sack a land, and you search your library for two basic lands, which is important for Phylath, and then you put them on the battlefield tap. So instant speed, 2x landfall trigger is also pretty powerful. It's like a slightly worse Harrow, but Harrow is quite good. So you're going to, you know, both yeah. are good. <laughs> yeah, both are good. You can <laughs> you can choose one or the other. Uh, Rolling Regrowth, because it was a Zendikar Rising card, I wanted to mm -hmm. highlight it. Uh, Scape Shift, of course, in the deck. It's two green green for a sorcery. Sacrifice any number of lands. Search your library for up to that many land cards. Put them onto the battlefield, tapped, then shuffle your library. And it's just lands. Just lands, It doesn't yeah. say basics or anything, so you... Uh, in modern, famously, people would go get Valakut and just kill people with this. You could all probably do stuff like that in this deck, but honestly, just saying, oh, I've got 10 lands in play, I'll sack all those and get 10 new lands and 10 new landfall triggers, that's 40 power that Phyleth puts in the board in that scenario. 
Yeah, and also scapeshift is great because you can tap all your lands, and so it's like you've used all your mana, you can float some mana, then scapeshift, get all those other lands into play, and not have to worry about like, oh, darn, they're coming into play tapped or whatever. It's like at that point, you should have enough mana over to fling or do whatever else with. Uh, the next area is called plants, 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 because Phyleth cares about plants. Turns out there actually aren't that many plants in red and green. I thought there would be more, but there... Are they in other colors? I mean, there's them um, in black and stuff. I was just huh. looking around for, like, solid plant cards, and I couldn't find too many, but the ones I if did green find, doesn't have a lot of plants, like, who does? Like, well, it just green turns out like, there aren't that many plants yeah, in Magic. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Where, uh, plant just tribal's a, hard to pull off, you're saying? Yeah, and I was like, I was, I'm going to find every card that makes zero one green plant creature token, and there are not that many. <laughs> you're so. like, after the sixth one, you're like, that's it. Yeah, there's a lot of other tribes that I think are much more supported. Plants, maybe we'll get some more love in some upcoming sets. Uh, but I love a couple of these cards, which are mana dorks that can ramp early, but more importantly, attack later. A lot of times, these mana dorks will have defender on them, mm. uh, but still be a plant. Uh, but these ones do not. Utopia Tree and Elysian Carry Added are both one in a green for a creature plant, and they both can tap to add a mana of any color to your mana pool. Oh, man. I so, always thought Elysian, like, they, I always thought they had Defender, you're right. Right, yeah. It's an o, One of them is an O2, it should have Defender, but no, it doesn't. Right, so you have Utopia scroll, uh, Tree or Elysian Carry added early, you can ramp out Phylath, and then once you get those landfall triggers, the 0-2 becomes a 4-6, then it becomes an 8-10, mm -hmm. and so these once, they, they used to be mana dorks, now they're creatures that can, like, swing in for lethal, which I mm -hmm. think is pretty hilarious. Uh, um, there's a couple of cute interaction plants as well, or cards, that I thought were really fun. This one, I think, is kind of like a Josh Lee Kwai type card. Tree of Redemption, three and a green for an 013 defender, but it's a plant. This one is a defender, but it says tap, exchange your life total with Tree of Redemption's toughness. So you can always go to 13. However, if you manage to put enough counters on this thing, it could definitely be like a life gain card, right? Yeah. Like if you're down to 10 and you just hit, if you scape shift, and just you be like, this oh, thing, yeah, give yeah. this thing 16 more toughness. So I'm going to exchange, yeah, so it's got 19 toughness, no, no, or 29, 29 yeah. toughness, and you're just like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to 29. Yes. And then you could do that the next turn if they don't kill it, too, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, and this is the kind of deck that's trying to tap and attack a lot. As you guys, if you watch Game Nights, you'll notice that I went to a pretty low life total pretty quickly, and having a Tree of Redemption out with a bunch of landfall triggers might have been something that could have saved my life in the long run. Uh, Turn Timber Sower is a new commander card, two in a red, two in a green, sorry, for a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere, create a 0-1 green plant creature token. Yay! And it's repeatable, that's what's great. Yeah, so anytime you do a fetch land or whatever, you'll get more 0-1 green plants. And you can also play a green to sack three creatures and return target land card from your graveyard to your hand. So you can rebuy a fetch land or whatever else it is if, you don't, if you're not running that Crucible package. I like this, these next two, and these are both from War of the Spark, is that right? Yes. Because uh, they have the proliferate mechanic. So it's Bloom Hulk, which is three and a green uh, for a 4-4 four, four plant elemental. But when it enters the battlefield, you proliferate, which means choose any number of permanents and or players, then give each another counter of each kind that's already there. So obviously, plus one counters on your plants. This is going to give one more to each of them. And it is a plant itself, so you yep. can put counters on it. And then Evolution Sage, two and a green for an Elf Druid. It's a 3-2, but whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, pro proliferate. So this is perfect, because you're already hitting landfall triggers and putting counters onto stuff. And then Evolution Sage just says, oh, just keep doing that more. Yeah, so you get five power and toughness from each one instead. Um, j these are just kind of like general value, big, make yep. big creatures, kind of Timmy, right? Just like, I want huge things. Um, except in this case, we're not swinging in necessarily with all of them because we'd rather fling in with them. <laughs> Don't swing in, fling in. Fling in, yeah. Nice. Math is for flingers, I guess. <laughs> uh, so fling is a classic magic card. It's one in a red for an instant as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature. Fling deals damage equal to the sacrificed creature's power to any target. So this is the direction I wanted to go with the deck, which is instant speed fling spells. Out of nowhere, boom, you try and block. I, I have a 16 power creature attacking you and a, seven, and a 20 power creature attacking you. You block the 20 power one. You take 16. I fling the 20 power one at you and you should should be dead at that point yeah that's it's like i've got really big creatures but you think you've got it under control because you got a blocker or a propaganda or something and nope just kidding yeah so the the important part about a lot of the fling spells is that they're instant and that they can also do their damage to any target so you could also just do it to a creature uh souls fires two in a red and it this actually doesn't require you to fling it it just says target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to any target so you keep the creature you don't you keep the creature it. yeah this one's actually really interesting i didn't realize this card existed oh yeah i've looked at this before for other decks it's uh grab the reins three in a red for an instant it says choose one until end of turn you gain control of target creature and it gains haste 
but also sacri- sorry the other choice is sacrifice a creature grab the reins deals damage equal to that creature's power to target creature or player and then you can entwine it which means you can choose both if you pay two in a red so their idea is you steal somebody's creature and then fling it at them or something yeah um but you could also just steal somebody's creature and then fling your huge creature at them. And yeah, just, and it gets rid of a blocker, yep. let's say. So now you swing in there with everything and then... And in this deck, you might just be happy to just only do the one, right? Just pay mm-hmm. four mana, sacrifice a creature, and fling it at somebody and not even steal one of their creatures because that will often be killing them because you've got like 16 one one counters on it or whatever. Yeah, and we've talked about how threatened effects can just sometimes win you the game because they have that one thing that's stopping you from doing everything. Or yeah, like, I, if only we can get rid of that thing. I love this card in the deck because you can use the threaten effect in those instances where it will just win you the game out of nowhere. Yeah. But you mostly want it for the fling effect because you know you're going to use that. So you just kind of get that other flexibility sometimes. Yeah. And Rupture might be one of the best cards in the deck. It's two in red for a sorcery, sack a creature. Rupture deals damage equal to that creature's power to each creature without flying in each player mm. so this can just be a straight up end the game immediately um let's it say flings you, it at everybody it flings it at everyone simultaneously and each creature without flying so it also can just be a board wipe it sometimes. hits you too though so i hope you have that tree of redemption yeah i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> you got a tree of redemption and it's like all right i'm gonna make my life really high and hit everyone or like it takes me down to one and i'll boost myself back up to whatever it is you have control of it so if it's gonna yeah. kill you you don't have to do it yeah exactly yeah and um, then uh, one the next favorites. one's a lot similar to that and i think also one of the best cards in the deck is chandra's ignition three red red for a sorcery target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature and each opponent each opponent so this would be a card that if you had it in your hand and you drew uh drew scape shift you're probably going to win right because you yeah. scape shift all your lands float the mana 10 landfall triggers put it all on one creature then chandra's ignition deal 40 or whatever to everybody yep Okay, the next part of flinging it uh, is called uh, Whoops, no, You're Dead. We renamed this category to Don't Swing It, Fling It. Oh, yeah, Don't Swing It, Fling It. Uh, in this case, it's less of a fling, but more of a, uh, haha, a little tricky way to get around stuff. So Outmaneuver is X and a red for an instant. X target block creatures deal combat damage to the defending player instead of blocking creatures this turn. Wait, what? Yeah, so <laughs> let's say you swing in with three 16, 17s. You, all three of them get blocked. You pay four mana, and now all three of those creatures just... It's Ignore, as if they weren't blocked. As if they weren't blocked, yeah. Well, they still take damages if they were blocked, but they don't. They deal damage just to the player it's instead better of than trample. Creatures. Yeah, it's better than trample. It just gets right through to the player. Uh, it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, sorry, you thought you had this all blocked and figured out. Doesn't matter. Yeah, you're like, okay, you made seven tokens and you thought you were just fine. Yeah, <laughs> because you gotta block. keep blocking my stuff. Yeah, and this stuff doesn't have trample, so it's fine. And you're, nope, you're dead. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Whoops, you're dead. Uh, the next one we saw on Game Nights, it's Mage Slayer. One green red for an equipment... It costs three to equip, but it says whenever equip creature attacks, it deals damage equal to its power to defending player. So just as soon as you declare attack, boom, it hits him for 16. That's what I learned. Yep, pretty <laughs> exactly good. Exactly 16. Exactly 16. It's always going to be 16, apparently. Um, <laughs> nice thing is that you don't need to atta- have them hit the creature. You don't even have it be blocked, whatever. It does the damage, and then if they don't block, it does even more damage. Yep. So you could attack, fling it, do all that stuff. Um, this deck, again, is looking to like put out 30 40 points of damage in a single turn and just take out the player out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, if things are getting dicey and people are like, hey, we need to get rid of these creatures, then you're going to want to play a brand new card that is not a plant but is very fun. It's Slippery Bog Bonder, three in a green for a flash, three, three with hexproof. When Slippery Bog Bonder enters the battlefield, put a hexproof counter on target creature. Then move any number of counters from among creatures you control onto that creature. Oh, so you go... Yeah, this is one of those things I was saying where it's really tough because if you attack with like three plants, yeah. which everyone's not blocked, you go boom, bog bonder, X proof, and it goes shoo. Yeah, not just counters from there, but maybe you have creatures that didn't attack, yep. move 40 counters onto a single creature, and then it's got hex proof on top of it. Rough. Rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rough. Rough. Uh, and the next one, anytime you're playing with counters, you're probably going to be playing this card now because it's only it's the Ozolith and it's only one mana for a yep. legendary artifact. And when a creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it had counters on it, put those counters onto the Ozolith. And then at the beginning of combat on your turn, if the Ozolith has counters on it, you may move all counters from it onto target creature. This is a way to just keep your counters around, right? Because something dies, it had eight counters on it, eight counters going on Ozolith. Then at combat, 
on your next turn, you put those eight counters onto the creature. Let's say that creature dies. Mm -hmm. Those counters go onto the Ozolith. So it's just gets pretty hard to get rid of them. You have to exile or bounce or get, you know. Yeah, and the the counters just keep adding up. It could be four the first time, then there's eight, then there's, you know, 12 on yeah, there. It's when 16. the creature leaves the battlefield, too, so you can't even exile or bounce. You have to kill the Ozolith. Yeah, you have to get rid of the Ozolith. Yeah. So the, the card is pretty nuts. Again, it's just a way to ensure that you you made all this work to get those creatures uh, big with your landfill triggers. Now you got to make sure those counters stick around. Yeah, that's pretty scary. Um, the last sort of segment about this deck is, yes, Trample does matter a bit, or just sort of big damage outside of being able to fling stuff at people. Um, I think, like, the most conventional way of winning with this deck is just making a bunch of plants, having plants that aren't from Phyleth also have counters on them, and just swinging out constantly. Yeah, and just making it so that you can't block, and, oh, you can block three out of the four, and then I have tricky ways to either switch the counters around, add more counters, or fling to get you the last of the way there. Yep, so Xanagos is sort of i think one of the better cards in the deck again it's just a card that adds plus x plus x to a target creature at the beginning combat in your turn where x that creature's power so it just doubles everything gives a haste too yep uh invigorating surge is also really similar it's two and a green for an instant you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control then you double the number of plus one plus one counters on that creature so that if it's an eight nine it goes to a nine ten and then it gets oh sorry yeah and then it would get nine, nine more plus one, yeah it goes counter. 18 19 Oh my lord! I mean, at that point, also this is it's a great an instant. Setup. Yeah, so that's a, <laughs> another like, hey, you didn't block it. That's what I learned about this deck. You can't not block the plants unless like he's tapped out because the one that gets through can often kill you or at least like you thought it was going to hit you for four. No, it's going to hit you for twenty four. Yeah, and it was to me again the the way I played game nights was like I'm putting someone at four, letting them die immediately to a single attack. Let's let someone else finish them off because I couldn't <laughs> do it, and um, that didn't pan out exactly how I wanted it to. Uh, the next one is a land. It's Skarg the Rage Pits. It can tap for a colorless or diamond mana, but you can also pay a green and a red and tap it. And target creature gets plus one, plus one, and gains trample until end of turn. So a land that gives trample. Yep, very nice. And then Garrick's Uprising is actually one of the better mm -hmm. cards in the deck. It's two and a green for an enchantment. If When Garrick's Uprising enters the battlefield, if you control creature with power four or greater, draw a card. And again, the smallest your plant can be with one land, while trigger is a four or five. And Phyleth is a five, five. So. Yep. Creatures you control have trample, and whenever a creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under control, draw a card. So that one's a little less relevant because a lot of the creatures here, uh, you're making them bigger with the landfall triggers. But again, just like being able to draw a card when this first comes in and give your creatures trample, trample yeah. occasionally drawing a card off it, it's where you want to be. I like the deck. Uh, a lot of the reason I like it is because you actually put more emphasis on winning through not combat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Which I think is smart because combat, we always say it, but it's true. It's the most conventional and most common way for players to have for what a deck wants to do right if you were just to say you know blind what is the best odds of what any given deck a single person is going to have what it's going to want to do to me most of the time you know your best guess is well kill me through combat damage right that's just the most common way to die so yeah. as a result everybody just builds their deck so they can at least handle creature combat they have some answer for it they, nobody builds a deck and is like well what if someone attacks you with creatures I have no oh, answer have for that no idea what to do yeah well, I'm, I, why who would do that I'm never prepared for that and uh, combat is just tough because you have to enter a combat phase you have to tap the creatures to declare where they're going to be attacking and so you, you just for cast what you're doing way ahead of ever actually doing the combat damage so making that sort of the sub theme of the deck where it's like yeah i can do that obviously the, but but i'm going to concentrate in this other area i think it's smart get around all their stuff so that's it that's the phylath uh, fling sculpture deck it's all about don't don't swing it fling it don't swing it fling it that was great <laughs> we just came up with that in the middle of the thing well he did but i just glommed onto it okay we um, came up with it josh you can take credit too to the listeners <laughs> what legend from zendikar rising have you built around or do you want to build around and why what are the challenges that you're running into when you're sort of building these decks we'd like to hear from you in the comments on twitter in all the normal places yeah it'd also be great to know if you're using the modal dfcs in a cool unique way uh, or you're just abusing landfall because there's so much of it in this deck uh, and not this deck this whole set and mm -hmm. so it'd be interesting to see if people are like hey my this deck got way better because of these cards always fun to see that stuff all right and if you want to pick up the mdfc's or maybe phylath akiri any of the new legendary creatures from zendikar rising maybe the new precon commander decks mm -hmm. you want to get booster boxes packs set boosters there are so many things to get now cardkingdom.com slash command zone that is the place where you want to go to get them because they're going to ship you your stuff faster than anybody else and it's going to be in better condition yeah that's the best feeling in the world is getting your cards opening them up and being like i ordered these two days ago this is crazy 
I can play them right now. <laughs> uh, and of course, a big thank you as always to Ultra Pro. You can see we have some new playmats underneath us here oh, from yeah. Zendikar Rising. They are the expedition art, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, as always, Ultra Pro with every new set comes out with beautiful new playmats and new art. So you're always able to sort of refresh what your battlefield looks like or just theme it around what you want to do. Plus, a lot of these I use as just mouse pads. I have oh, yeah. them all around my house. So they're multi purpose, really well made. We rely on them to protect our cards, to make our playmats for our Kickstarters. And we can't recommend them highly enough so the next time you're at your lgs and you want to support them you can definitely buy some ultra pro products and you'll also be supporting us yeah for sure you want to protect all your game pieces all right uh before we go here we just wanted to give a reminder that auditions for game nights are currently open there's a couple of rules and restrictions the um, there's gonna be a link in the show notes click on that for all of them a couple of restrictions i want to tell you about but there's not all of them necessarily mm -hmm. uh, you got to be 18 years or older to audition sorry that's just a legal thing i know our younger fans they always guilt trip us about it we we don't want that to be the case but that just is the case i'm sorry that's just the if we could we would allow we you would. yeah, yeah we just can't um and then uh the other thing is that a patron at any level is uh qualified to audition so one dollar per month and you can enter the auditions there is a deadline though um it's november 1st so yes yeah and and your audition will take a little bit of work so you probably want to go click on that link read through the rules and restrictions the deadlines all the info on how to enter and yeah make sure you enter correctly we've been getting a few emails that's just like a link and that's not going to cut it. We we have to organize these emails so they don't just disappear everywhere as well. Yeah, we need your information. All that stuff is listed. Just make sure that you follow the instructions because there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of people that are going to submit auditions and we're going to it'll be easy for us to just disqualify people that, you know, just didn't follow the instructions. Yeah. Also, like if you're not following the instructions, well, we kind of need you to follow the instructions when you come film too, so yeah. it's a good sign that you know how to follow <laughs> the instructions. Oh, and if you were a part of the Game Nights Kickstarter last year right. and qualified for an audition, you can send in two. One for the game nights and one for the patreon if you happen to be on patreon yeah that's a really good point uh if you were at the champion level or above for the it was the coins and the t-shirt mm -hmm. uh kickstart from last year then you are eligible to audition and those are separate we're going to pick one person from the kickstart one from patreon so if you qualify for both audition for both i would suggest sending in two different audition yeah two tapes. different decks you're going to talk about yeah. or experiences or whatever you want to share yeah it's a story from a commander game tell us two different stories just because if it's the same one then we might get mixed up as to which is which yeah totally okay um now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic it's like it ambushed me like i was like yeah. oh yeah and end step. the episode's done we only uh -oh. do it on every single episode of the podcast <laughs> and yet somehow it came out of nowhere for me have you been watching anything fun um, have I been watching or anything reading? fun or eating? <laughs> I, I mean, it's hard to eat right now because the pandemic. So it's all just delivery food, right? Yeah, like delivery and at home or, cooking. Or at home cooking. Yeah. So there's not. Oh, you know what? I've yeah. been doing a lot of uh, charcuterie plates. Oh, cool. At home. This is a thing that uh, my girlfriend and I. We have this tradition now on Saturdays. Okay. I make the charcuterie plate, but we usually like go to the grocery store and I have like a little cheese collection now and we have some prosciutto and oh, some nice. other cut it cured meats and I get it ready and that's that's me cooking, quote unquote, because I'm, right. I'm not a good cook. <laughs> Josh's cooking is just cutting meat and cheese and crackers up. Yep. <laughs> I, I display it nicely. If you follow me on Twitter, like I, I put a lot into the presentation part go. of it, a little bit of hummus. Um, they say you, you know. eat with your eyes. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. Charcuterie plates are great. I love prosciutto. I love a good prosciutto. Um, it's a simple, uh, nice way to express yourself as a culinary artist as well as have a delicious meal. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> do you have a favorite cheese? Uh, I man, I'm so basic. I just I love cheddar. Yep. I also love goat cheese. Oh yeah. Um, I would eat blue cheese more if it didn't have a vendetta against my stomach and internal system. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that can mess up your stomach. Um, I think blue cheese hamburgers though are my favorite ooh. kind of cheese to put on a burger. We yeah, like a truffle goat cheese. We did this ooh. thing and we had a fig jam. No oh, nice. So truffle goat cheese fig jam uh, on a any sort of like you don't want the cracker to have a lot of flavor because it'll overpower the flavor of yep. that. But goat cheese. Fig jam, very, very good together there. That's my end step. Try That's that. Nice. Goat cheese and jam is, is yeah. an excellent combination. Yeah, because it's like that sweet and savory thing yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like dipping a French fry in a milkshake. Yeah, it's making me hungry. And it's <laughs> almost lunchtime, so. It is. <laughs> Let's get there. Uh, but quickly, we have to thank our editing, graphics, and logistics team here at the Command Zone, which is Ashlyn Rose, Craig Blanchett, Lady Danger, Manson Lung. Jake Boss, Josh Murphy, Alfred Estaca, Patrick Non, and Sam Waldo. Then we have another edition, right? Oh, and Justin... Justin. No, and Justin Masseth. Nice. Yes. 
Thanks, everyone. You all rock. I almost forgot Justin. He likes it. He's been here two days. I'll remember his <laughs> uh, his uh, last name better. To Josh's credit, I didn't even know the first or last name because it, <laughs> I just you just met him. The, I just met him yeah. literally. I sat down and I was like, "Hello, <laughs> nice to meet you." And of course, special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer and Sam Waldo who do the Living Card animations behind this. This one's done by Sam. Uh, a bunch of them are done by Jeffrey, who also has done the opening animations on our YouTube channel at YouTube.com/slash The Command Zone Podcast. You can give Jeffrey some love on Twitter as always at Living Cards MT. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Let's go get lunch. Yeah, please. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com. Or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>